Good evening. Welcome to the University of Manchester Joint East Asia and Southeast Asia Centre webinar, Unlocking the Power of Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age. This is Phoenix, the External Relations Officer from the University of Manchester East Asia Centre. Nice to meet you all. Tonight, we have students, alumni, members of professional institutions across the region, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, Malaysia, and so on. Thank you for joining us tonight and for tonight's rundown. We will first have a keynote speech on, the, on understanding AI is potential for business and the opportunities for implementations. Then we will have the panel discussion on impact, opportunities, and flows of AI. If you have any questions during the time, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the bottom of your Zoom screen. And our moderator will pick up your questions at the panel discussions. We will also have a short introduction of our MSc in Financial Management program before the end of this webinar. For tonight's topic, not only the finance industry have involving more and more AI application in their daily operations, but also other industries such as the supply chain and other business field too. We are honored to have four seasoned speakers, Mr. Andrew Gova, Ms. Ring Lim, Ms. Donna Buckland, and Mr. Chai Kit Choi. They will share their insights tonight. So let's move to the speaker introductions. Firstly, we have Andrew, who is the Chief Examiner Asia and Director of Compliance Education APAC, an international compliance chain academic. With the solid experience in finance, especially in compliance, Andrew designed and delivered a new program mapping to local education standards in Australia, Hong Kong, and Southeast Asia region. He is also a visiting fellow and member and mentor for the University of Manchester. Next, we have Donna, Senior Director, Controllership and Change at Prudential Corporation Hong Kong. Donna heading the regional governance and strategic finance innovation in initiatives across 12 markets in Asia Pacific. Besides, she is passionate about sustainability and is a board member of the international NGOs, including Rotary Club and UNESCO Hong Kong. Donna is an alumna of the Manchester Global MBA program. Moving onwards, we have Ring, Group VP at Asia Splunk. Ring leading her team driving revenue growth across key markets in the region. With more than 20 years of experience in spanning sales, market and business development, as well as channel recruitment and enablement, Rain is passionate about using technology to help organizations move forward in their digitalization journey and realize outstanding business outcome. She is also our Manchester Global MBA alumni too. Last but not least, we have Chai Kit, CEO and co-founder of Synosis Solutions. Under his le leadership, Synosis Solutions is recognized as a Red Tech 100 company and has received the MAS FinTech Award in 2018. Chaikit also named one of the top 10 fintech leaders at the Singapore Fintech Award 2019 and is now serving as a board member of the ICA Singapore Education Advisory Board. We are very grateful for all our speakers spending their time to prepare for tonight and I shouldn't keep you for too long and now I will pass the stage to Andrew to start his keynote speech on unlocking the power of AI. Thank you. And what's the meme of the 2020s? You're on mute. Um, yes, I realised I was on mute. Um, hopefully you can now see my screen. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Phoenix, for myself and all of my fellow panellists. Um, a very good evening to you. It was lovely to see all the hellos and highs as everybody joined. That was very nice. Um, so I repay that hi and hello. Um, before I get going tonight, before I talk about um, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about tonight, I thought it worth mentioning that the uh, so the general objective is for me is I'm going to talk about the macro level, the high level, because we have to recognise that there are many, many different interpretations, different agendas and different concerns surrounding this subject, people coming from different perspectives. So I'm going to look at the high, uh, the macro level, and then we're going to get the panel involved looking at the application the specifics, what's actually happening. Um, out in the world with the use of AI and other technologies and new technologies. So hopefully we get the best of both worlds, as I said before. The problem is, or one of the issues is that even the experts cannot agree 
on so many aspects of uh, AI and new technology. So what we have here tonight are some opinions, some research uh, that we've carried out. And also we've had to recognize that the subject itself is huge. We could barely even hope to scratch the surface um, this evening, but hopefully we'll give a little bit more understanding some insights and perhaps prompt people to go away and do some research um, on their own. So as I say, I look at the macro side of things and then panelists will look uh, at the micro side of things. Do feel free to use the chat function, uh, as Phoenix said, and I'll try to keep an eye on that for when we get to the Q&A session. So my objective tonight uh, is to cover a number of, sort of key areas, uh, I guess. Um, looking at artificial intelligence, what is it? What is it really? What is it not? There are a lot of misunderstanding about this. Uh, looking at robotics, are robots artificially intelligent? Is there more than one type of AI? Uh, AI in current everyday use, you know, we, we, we're seeing it and perhaps don't even realize it um, a lot of the time. I had a section or have a section here called, is AI going to put me out of the job? And I know that that's a big, big issue, an ongoing concern. And I also know that Rain has some particular uh, insights on that. We'll be talking to her about that uh, a little bit later. Um, and then the final question, it may seem obvious, but it isn't. Uh, should AI be regulated? If so, how, who, and when and where? So if we look at uh, that, I wanted to start with what is AI? What is AI itself? The Oxford English Dictionary defines AI as theory and development of a computer system or computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. That would be visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, that kind of thing. Essentially, it's a branch of computer engineering that is trying to get to the position, to the point where machines behave like human beings. Now, AI has come a long way, an awful long way in recent years, but it is still missing, as far as we know, still missing essential pieces of human behavior, such as emotional behavior, identifying new objects and handling them smoothly the, the way that a human um, would handle it. It's a simulation um, at best. Somebody actually said in terms of emotional behavior, if you ask one of your at-home uh, you know, Siri, Cortana, whatever. It doesn't matter whether you shout at it in an angry voice or whisper in it in a loving voice, you'll still get the same answer. It isn't able to process uh, emotions. Some AI is going down that route, but generally speaking, it hasn't got there yet. There is also a confusion between robotics and AI. People are asking this question, are robots artificially intelligent? Um, and the answer is, well, <laughs> It can be confusing, but robotics and AI are actually two separate things. They can be put together in the end, but they are two separate things. Robotics is about building physical robots that interact with the physical world, whereas AI is about programming intelligence. As I say, and I will come back to this later, the two can be merged, but they are treated as separate uh, disciplines. Having said that, back to my point about lack of uh, total agreement, there's a considerable lack of agreement um, about what a robot actually is. Some, people, some experts are saying that a robot must have the ability to think and make decisions. Others are saying there are plenty of robots out there that have neither of those traits, but they are still robots. So one school of thought says that a robot has to be capable of interacting with the physical world via sensors or actuators or whatever it may be. It must be programmable and it must usually be autonomous or semi-autonomous, but even that is unclear and it does bear some closer scrutiny. And I was thinking about this and I thought, well, what about one of the best-selling toys in recent years, drones, a drone, is it a robot? Well, it certainly acts, uh, interacts with the physical world. It can be pre-programmed to make flights from point A to point B, but is it autonomous? Hmm. In general use, I am caveat caveating that, in general use, perhaps not. The drones that we tend to see, perhaps not. So perhaps it falls into another subcategory, the so-called tele-robotics category a robot controlled entirely by a human operator. 
maybe. But again, I, I, I will come back to that. Most industrial robots that we see would be described as non-intelligent. They perform a specific task. They move an object from A to B by mechanical means. And this would include even some of the seemingly far more sophisticated um, assembly lines, car assembly lines, for example, where it looks very complex, but actually what it is, is, is moving, it's moving an object through a predefined three-dimensional space and you know, pressing the spray button, if they're going to be doing the painting as well, at certain times. So they're often referred to as another type, they're often referred to as cobots or collaborative robots. So we could spend um, an awful lot of time on this, but we don't have that kind of luxury tonight. Um, so I will move on, or I'll come back to that other point a little bit later. We do get crossovers where uh, a robot is controlled by an AI program. And I said I'd come back to it. Take my earlier example of a drone. If you fly, anybody who's uh, flown a drone around will know that there are a couple of real issues with it. Um, one of which is you've got it flying away from you and then it exceeds the range of your controller or it passes beyond the range where it has enough battery power to get back to the controller. This is where AI can come in. It can be uh, fitted with a system that says, actually, I'm about to exceed the range of the controller. I'm going to ignore now what the human being controller means does, and I'm going to return to base. The same with when it's about to uh, exceed its battery range. It uses autonomous navigation to simply return to home before it runs out of power. So maybe that is an artificially intelligent robot or telerobot or half. I said it was, I said it was confusing. Um, we will continue to get crossover. As the, as the sciences um, increase, so does our um, understanding and the merging of the two. So you can see, see here, I tried to say you've got robotics, you've got artificial intelligence, and they kind of meet um, in the middle. Is there one time, more than one type of AI? Yes, even that's not as straightforward as, as we would hope. Again, a huge subject. We could talk about functionality-based AI, capability-based AI, analytical AI, human-inspired AI, humanized AI, theory of mind, self-awareness, and a myriad of, of other branches. As I said, there was so much to, uh, to, to look into, but we haven't got time here. But if we wanted to distill it down to its essence, there are arguably, I say arguably, three main categories of AI. There's artificial narrow intelligence, AI, artificial general intelligence, AGI, and artificial superintelligence, ASI. ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, is generally considered to be weak, weak AI. However, we call it weak AI, but it does actually seem to have an awful lot of power. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. But ANI generally is regarded as the weak one, whereas a GI and a SI are classified as strong um, AI. But like I said, don't be put off by this. The majority of the current systems, the systems we see and use now, would fall under the weak artificial narrow intelligence category, including some of the most complex predictive modeling that you've ever seen. Weak AI is often characterized by its ability to complete um, a very specific task. Uh, Mary, I can share the PowerPoint after the event. Thank you for asking that question which popped up in chat. Um, if you wish, that's fine. I'm, I'm very happy to do that. So as I was saying, weak AI, it's about ability to complete a very specific task, but it could be a very specific and complex task. For example, winning a game of chess or playing the ancient Chinese game of Go. You probably heard about this. Go, by the way, is believed to be the world's oldest continuously played game. It's over 2,500 years old. Um, you could program a machine to do that. You can program it to identify a specific individual or object in a series of photographs or from a camera face recognition technology uh, springs to mind. So a lot of people will be aware that it was as long ago, uh, actually, as 1996, when get the Gary Casper, perhaps the greatest human chess player ever, played a computer called Deep Blue. 
Uh, what people forget, actually, is that 1996, Kasparov won narrowly four games to two. It was the rematch the following year in 1977 that Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. This was a complete watershed moment in the advancement of such technology and really cemented the producers, IBM, as an innovator of, of AI. It led to, amongst other things, the, the Watson supercomputer. The Watson supercomputer was used, which used machine learning and natural language uh, processing to actually beat the world Jeopardy champions, the, the, the game Jeopardy in 2011. And that seemed incredible enough at the time, but they didn't stop there. They built a machine to play Go, and they called it AlphaGo. People will acknowledge that Go has far more simple rules to it than chess, where every piece has to you know, do a, has a certain function. The rules for Go are far more simple. However, it's been calculated that after the first two moves, chess has about 400 possible next moves to choose from. In Go, there are close to 130,000 possible next moves. Bit of a shift. Unlike Deep, deep uh, Blue, AlphaGo didn't look at all the possible moves. Instead, it used deep learning, or not machine learning, but deep learning to focus on what are the best positions from here? And it did it by reviewing countless other games that have already been played. And it got so good, it won most of the time. But again, they didn't stop there. They then developed AlphaGo Zero. The difference here, AlphaGo was shown how games have gone on in the past, and it was shown all the possible permutations. Instead, with Alpha Zero, they said, hmm, let's not teach it anything. Let's just tell it what the rules are and let it train itself. There are no preconceptions and no biases. It'll train itself. AlphaGo Zero beat AlphaGo every game, 100% of the time, which is quite staggering. And then they went on to build Alpha Zero, which can play chess, Go, and Shogi, and that actually beat AlphaGo Zero. So the technology, when we remove the, this is how humans have done it, and just let it learn itself, has proven to be far more effective and far more efficient. But it is still classed as weak in terms of AI. The stronger forms of AI, AGI and ASI, as I mentioned earlier, do incorporate more human behaviors. That would include the ability to interpret tone and emotion. And it's very uh, interesting when I, I, I watch my, my mother-in-law talking to her, her dogs and the dog does something naughty and she goes, oh really, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. No, get down. And I'm listening to the tone that's being used and you can see the dog thinking, well, you know, obviously talking to me in a very nice tone, things must be okay. Um, tone needs to be far more clearly delineated. It doesn't have any impact in the world of AI as yet. Talking of talking and the ability to interpret tone and emotion, then we get to uh, another aspect, um, chatbots. I'm sure we've all been on our PCs, computers, whatever, and a chatbot pops up. I've been teaching a couple of courses on this over the last week, actually, and I've done quite a bit of surveying with the, the people involved and asked, what is your view of chatbots? And almost invariably, it's... I try, but eventually I get so frustrated. I just wish there was a human there because the chatbot technology isn't there yet. It is still a function of pick something up and do a predetermined response. But what about the virtual assistants such as Siri, or Cortana, or I can't say the name because I've got one next to me and it'll wake up and start talking to me. They're leaning towards AGI, but they're still very much A and I. As I said before, if you shout in an angry voice or talk softly, you'll still get the same answer. So stronger AI is generally defined by its ability more closely comparing it to what humans do. And so AGI, artificial general intelligence, is talking about a machine that will perform on par, equivalent to the level of a human being. Artificial super intelligence would surpass our intelligence and our ability. And I say this because as far as we know, there is no strong form of uh, artificial superintelligence yet, as far as we know. 
but it continues. Um, and who knows uh, what people are going to develop. So it is about making it more human. Chatbots, not there yet. We are seeing artificial intelligence in use all the time. Anybody who flies a lot will be aware of driverless trains. If you go to Changi Airport, uh, go, um, so, uh, I was thinking I was in Malaysia, was the last airport. So you'll see driverless trains all the time. It's a stretch of track where the train just basically shuttles backwards and forwards. There's no driver in it. It's using artificial intelligence um, to know when to go. Of course, it's staying on the tracks, which kind of helps. It won't deviate from that. But when to open the doors, when to stop, where to stop, that sort of thing. People talk about driverless cars. Oh, we're not there yet. We have the ethical issues that sit behind it, um, you know, how it's going to behave under a certain circumstances. But actually, you may be surprised to find out that uh, we are further along uh, than you, you might think. 2019, uh, Berlin introduced driverless buses um, to its streets. Um, self-driving buses they work they uh but they're programming if you wanted to if you want to bring the bus system to a complete halt all you have to do is stand in front of it because it just basically goes well i can't go now and it doesn't know what else to do because it hasn't been programmed you just stand in front of it it will stop but we are getting there we're seeing it in cars you know lane control technology radar guided keeping this figure it's it's coming it's getting there but it's still not there yet Another use that we take for granted all the time, mobile phone technology. I was quite fascinated when I researched this, that Apple say that when they do your face recognition technology, they project over 30,000 invisible dots onto your face to create a map. And they take an infrared um, image of it as well. They say that, oh, pardon me, that's gone backwards. Their technology is so adaptable, you could grow a beard, put some makeup on, wear contact lenses. There are so many touch points um, on this, it will still recognize you. And the chances of you uh, having similar enough features to anybody else is like one in a million, um, so they say. Um, yeah, one in a million is about the chances. So we are seeing this every single day, and it's getting smarter all the time. Uh, constantly getting smarter. Um, one of the things that you can do on a phone is you can start measuring the, you can look at the way in which you hold your phone. And it's different from person to person. Some people will hold their phone more flat, some more vertical, some will hold it up here because maybe they can't see it quite so clearly. The way in which you use the keypad, I can say this because I'm older and it's not an ageist comment. Generally speaking, the younger generation tend to use two thumbs and they'll across the keyboard. I see my, my kids using their phone and they're so much quicker than I am uh, at using the, the little keyboard. I, I tend to be, okay, one finger, maybe one thumb uh, at a time. That can be stored and recognized. It's a form of identification to identify you, the way in which you use the phone. How many times you have to go back and correct a word? How many times you use the autocorrect, uh, the suggestions that are put up on there? They're all unique indicators. Um, this, as I say, is growing. Uh, day by day by day. Um, what about things like text editors? We see, you know, we see them all the time, Grammarly, and even the, one, the basic ones in Word that say, yeah, I know you wrote this, but I don't think you mean that. I think you mean this instead. Plagiarism senses, as, a, as an academic institution, we use them, and I know Manchester used them as well, to detect evidence that somebody has leaned heavily or borrowed uh, somebody else's work and claimed it as their own. We use it all the time. Social media feeds, predictive text on your phone. I was fascinated to learn uh, a while ago that if I type a phrase into a, the main Google search engine, the results I get will be different to the results you might get based upon my search history, my previous history. I just thought it took the you know, most common use of the word and then popped it up there. Apparently not. And all the little boxes that one sees down the side, if you go onto YouTube, you'll start seeing boxes down the side. I call it the YouTube spiral because you're on there and you say, oh, actually, that is quite interesting. I know because it's working on your previous history. So you click on that one. That's a bit more data for YouTube. Thank you very much. And then, oh, and that one. Uh, oh, and that was quite interesting. And then you end up in this sort of descending spiral where you're meant to be on there for two or three minutes. An hour goes by and oh, crikey, I'm, I'm still in the YouTube spiral. 
the recommendations that you get for from Netflix and I get the videos. Um, you've watched this, I think you should watch that. Somebody said a while ago, it's actually on one of the documentaries that you that, that Netflix put out. If you're on a commercial website and you don't know what the product is, it's you. You're the product. Just having you there, being able to sell and make you move and click on certain things. The amount of data that is held out there. There was a, a, a thing during the, the rounds recently of a chap who claimed to be a mind reader and he was pulling people into a studio with uh, black curtains around and he was telling them about the car they drove, where they lived, what credit cards they used, where their kids went to school. This all under the guise of reading their minds and people, you could see the people, they were astonished. And then somebody pulled back a curtain and showed big TV screens and it was actually all the data he had was pulled from social media feeds that people put out there, not realizing how much information that we have out there. And it was a great way of demonstrating we need, I mean, the gene is out the bottle now, we, we can't put it back in the bottle, but we do need to be conscious of how much of our footprint we're, we're putting out into the virtual world. Um, okay. Uh, this is something I know that um, Rain wants to talk about a little bit later, so I'm not going to major on it. Some uh, opinions do vary uh, hugely. You do have to consider the agenda, though, behind some of the opinions. I, I call it the Silicon Valley effect. Silicon Valley, people want to be cutting edge. They want to be the first ones out there to develop this. They want to be known as the person who invented this. And we'll worry about the ethical aspects of that a little bit later, or it's somebody else's problem. So they certainly don't want anything that would stop people talking um, about this or pushing this further forward. They don't want to see that at all. I can tell you, it was uh, Elon Musk, you must have heard of, you know, looking to buy Twitter, own SpaceX, which is man around. He actually likened artificial intelligence, and he's at the cutting edge of it, he likened it to the development of nuclear technology and actually said it's more dangerous than the development of nuclear technology. And you only have to look back at Robert Oppenheimer, who was the supervisor of the Manhattan Project that developed the atom bomb that was eventually dropped. Initially, it was all about the science and he was massively and hugely motivated. As he saw the results, I think it was Project Trinity, they called it, it was the test detonation of the nuclear bomb. He was known to, he was heard to quote the Bhagavad Gita, I am become death, I am the destroyer of worlds. And he became increasingly disillusioned, not with the science, but with the application of science. And I do think there is a parallel here. We just really need to be very, very careful. What can be wonderful for us in everyday use could also be used for nefarious purposes. We just have to be a little bit careful. I know, I think we'll be very careful. Um, some say that, um, no, it's going to just take away autonomous repetitive jobs and and that it will be great others are saying yes but that's more uh, the blue collar roles it's going to create a bigger divide others are saying it's the end of mankind and look at look at the terminator franchise if you want to see an example of how skynet you know, ruled the world uh, ruined the world sorry there was a study an oxford study that suggested that by the mid 2030s more than 47 percent of jobs in america will be under threat due to automation and AI, mid 2030s. We're only 12, 13, 14 years away from that. Actually, Elon Musk said 20, was predicted 2035 is the event horizon when AI will overtake humans, that's his prediction. Uh, and McKinsey reports said robotics will replace 30% of the workforce. But there are measures being taken to address this. You, you know, looking at conventional education system to try and focus the skills on things that are more difficult to replicate, critical thinking, innovation, creativity. Uh, and I have to give a shout out here to the Institute of Banking and Finance in Singapore, who produced a number of documents um, on this area, particularly to do with the compliance function, and because that, that's my bag, but it does apply uh, broader than that. Are you developing skills that it will be difficult to replicate. So they're calling it future enabled skills. I've I put a link down um, to the website. It's a big, much bigger document, but here's a, an extract from it. There was another one that was produced by um, Harvard, the Harvard Business Review, 
produced an article called Are You Developing Skills That Won't Be Automated? And again, there's, there's a link uh, to the slide. Uh, as I said, I know that our panelists will want to talk more about this because it is a big issue that people are concerned about. So I will refer, uh, I'll leave it there and I will come back to them uh, later. There is, I will say one thing, quite interesting. There is, a, there is talk about current roles being changed but not replaced. And the examples I read, one person said, there are a couple of companies out there when you go to buy a coffee, they have a mechanical barista who always makes the coffee exactly the same every time. And it's quite a bit of pantomime and drama with arms flying around and shushing noises. And it's designed to, to sort of captivate you and make you not worry about having to wait while somebody prepares your coffee. But somebody needs to set that emotion or program it or even talk to you and take the money. Or the other example, similar examples, what about a bartender? You know, let's have a machine mix the drinks for us. But what if you just want to go into a bar and have a chat with the barman? Maybe they still need a barman around to add. And it's increasing use of that human touch. So looking for uh, roles that require that human touch. People have said that uh, an automated doctor may be better at diagnosing illnesses, given the vast amount of data it can hold on to at any given point in time. But do you want to have a chat with one? Certainly not the way chatbots are at the moment, I would suggest. Maybe people feel more comfortable about talking to other people at this point in time. So um, there are many, many agendas. This is uh, coming to my final point. There are many, many agendas out there. As I said, the Silicon Valley agenda would be one of them. The question is, should artificial intelligence be regulated? Some say yes, some say no. Some say, actually, it's just not possible. Stanford University came out with a report that said it, uh, there, there should be no attempt to regulate AI. It would be misguided, since it's no clear definition of AI, and the risks are very different um, in different domains, and that's certainly true. I would again just look at the risks of implementing AI in Singapore versus the risk of the same AI being used in North Korea. Quite markedly different, I would suggest. Should AI be regulated? The EU have said, yes, they think it should, uh, which is a direct challenge to what Harvard and Silicon Valley are saying. They're saying there should be a regulatory structure in place, absolutely, that regulates the use of AI, um, heavy regulation for um, high risk uses and lighter regulation for low risk uses. We in the financial services world have seen evidences of attempts to regulate high risk and low risk by applying different levels, that's fine. Just going back to, sorry, forgive me, um, chatbots for a, sec, uh, as a moment. I was reading an article and you may, some of the older ones amongst you may remember this, it was 2016. Microsoft launched a chatbot called Tay, T-A-Y, and it was marketed as a chatbot for Twitter users to use to engage in, I quote, in casual and playful conversation. However, in less than 24 hours, at which point they took it down, in less than 24 hours, it had become smarter because it was learning from all the chats that it was having. However, the problem was, in becoming smarter, it made three distinct statements. Number one, Hitler was right. Number two, 9-11 was an inside job. And number three, feminism is a form of cancer. These were statements being made by this machine. It was immediately pulled uh, by Microsoft with a huge apolo uh, apology. You may remember that Amazon got into a little bit of trouble about their hiring um, uh, routine, they started using AI-based experimental hiring tool, uh, an AI-based experimental hiring tool, but it came with a major flaw, which they hadn't considered. It was biased against women. Why? Because it had been trained by looking at all the resumes submitted over the previous 10 years, there's a lot of resumes that have been submitted, and those that had ended up getting the jobs. A larger number were submitted by men than women, in fact, and the computer, because a larger number of men got jobs, became inherently biased. It taught itself to favour male candidates. And they discovered that things like any words such as women's, like women's chess club captain, automatically dropped that application down. 
Uh, in fairness, they were the ones that identified it. Um, and by 2015, they taught it to evaluate in a completely gender neutral way, and they eventually abandoned it. However, it did come to light in 2018 um, when they'd already, already um, dealt with it. Quick, uh, a quick other example. You may have heard about this story that's going around. Oh, Facebook had Facebook had two AI programs that were talking to each other in an unknown language. That, to a degree, is true. The programs were called Alice and Bob, and they did start talking to each other. But actually, what they were doing was a shorthand version of full English that they designed. It wasn't. A completely new language it's a shorthand version of english and they were not shut down as we would have it they were actually told to prioritize the correct use of english there's a little point in there for me so they did something on their own and they would have kept doing it until they were told not to slightly worrying it sort of neat to me it points to a parameter which says if you're building ai you have to remember to program it what not to do as much as you need to program it what it has to do and you then have to think of all the variables of what it shouldn't do and you need to think beyond the box or outside the box sorry as to what shouldn't happen bearing in mind it's not governed by any kind of ethical or moral compunctions i'll finish with a, a, a slightly funnier example um in the, in the united kingdom they use ai powered cameras at football matches nowadays they have ai powered cameras and the ai is trained to basically follow the football around so you don't get the camera man you know missing what's going on just follow the football when they run them there was a football match not so long ago where the ai camera um actually started tracking the bald head of one of the assistant referees because it looked like a football and this was uh, this was out live he was following the uh, assistant referee up and down the line uh, mistaking his head um, again, one last um, nod I have to give to Singapore, um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore this time, as opposed to the Institute of Banking and Finance. They, uh, they have created this thing, that, um, which they're calling a feat, um, to try and guide and require a, a form of regulation. Um, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency. And it's about the responsible use of AI and data analytics. It's an early stage yet, but at least you know, somebody is doing something. And I know, Chai Kit, you've been involved with Cosmic and other, uh, another few bits and pieces that perhaps we'll talk about later. So I've gathered a, a bit of a canter through um, AI and what its uses are. Ultimately, as I said, I, I think I'm not a Luddite who, who doesn't uh, want the advancement of, of science. I think there's some fabulous things that have already come out of it and have yet to come out of it. But I just emphasize a little bit of caution um, some are saying it will be 20 to 30 years before AI decides that it can run our lives and our planet better than we do. Uh, others would say, well, that's nonsense. AI does not have an agenda. It doesn't want to be a leader. It doesn't want to be a superpower. But logic can have strange and possibly unimagined outcomes. I set one of the groups I was working with a very quick quiz. If you wanted to eradicate financial crime, so internal company fraud, for example, all of it worldwide, I want to get rid of all fraud, and you give that to a human, we'd probably sit there and say, we well, just can't do it. It's just not possible. There are not enough systems and processes in the world to completely get rid of financial crime or internal fraud. Set that to a computer, and eventually it may be said, well, there is actually one solution, because fraud is committed for financial gain, and it's committed by people. So let's just get rid of all the people. I will achieve my mission. It's a stark reminder that they have to be that if you're thinking with no other moral as I say, or ethical issues behind it, you may come to some conclusions that would be quite surprising. I may sound a little bit alarmist, perhaps, but Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking before he passed, Bill Gates are all making noises along the lines of we just need to be careful here. So, as I say, in, in conclusion, there is no doubt in my mind. Uh, AI does offer massive advantages, but human nature being what it is, given what we've already seen, we do need to be a little bit careful uh, with it. So having looked at this high level, and I've just talked of a, a few sort of very high uh, overarching issues, we now want to look at how AI can be unlocked to transform businesses, 
how it has been and is being used to our benefit in business. And that's where we need to turn to our industry experts, our panelists. So I'm going to get the, the ball rolling by uh, throwing a, a, a question out to the panel. I will uh, stop sharing uh, my screen so that we can see what's going on. So now we should see our uh, lovely panelists appearing. Don't forget to turn your microphones on, guys, um, when you start talking. So if you now want to ask questions, if the audience now wants to ask questions, please do feel free, put them in the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye on that um, as it goes along. But I'm going to start with a um, question, if I can, to Ray. <clears throat> you, we were talking about this. We know that AI, machine learning, et cetera, can play a significant part in delivering a, a great customer experience. Can you share some examples of how to help us understand exactly how these technologies are actually being used? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, by the way, uh, thanks so much, Andrew. I thought that was a great presentation. Thank you. Now, um, yeah, consumer expectations, as we know, are becoming increasingly sophisticated. We are definitely more demanding than we than where we were in the past. And as brands fight for wallet share, um, the ability to kind of provide a frictionless customer experience actually goes a very long way to acquiring and also retaining customers. And um, you know, it's it's quite common knowledge that it's typically five times more expensive to acquire a new customer than to sell to an existing one. So it's imperative that organizations invest in technologies to improve the CX, right, or, or customer experience. Um, so this pandemic has accelerated digital transformation, which means that organizations are also collecting more data about their customers than ever before. Um, to me, I, I think it, it presents a very big opportunity for organizations to then make use of that data that they're collecting to get to know about their customers' preferences and also personalize the brand experience across multi-channels or omni-channels that the customer might, might engage their brands. Right? Some of the um, usages of AI could be you know, specifically to tailor messages and, and next best offers to be sent out to, uh, to their customers or prospects at the optimal timing via the best fit channels, um, where the chances of opening the messages are high. And also in the call center or service center, you see AI being used to kind of optimize the service call scheduling. Uh, they can also help with uh, cross-sell recommendations from the call center reps, uh, and also you know, help them to conduct customer outreach for you know, upgrade opportunities. Um, on the flip side, AI can also be used to identify unhappy customers based on their purchase and behavioral uh, patterns. And you can actually kind of reactivate the engagement by send, sending them a very nice personalized uh, message with maybe a loyalty reward like bonus points. And also, you know, you can use AI to determine what the value of the reward uh, should be for each customer or segment. So there are actually, you know, many, many great examples of AI. And I think one great example that I can I think of is probably Lululemon, and I think that brand is very familiar to you know probably most of us in the audience that does yoga or even general sports. Um, Lululemon has actually invested heavily um, over the past five years, right, to construct a 360 degree view of the customer. Now, when the guest makes a purchase at any retail location for the first time, then this person is actually asked to provide the email address to receive a receipt, and like you know, um, um, the emails are also collected. Uh, when the customers sign up for free in-store yoga classes. So like many brands, Lululemon actually use this personal information uh, to augment very basic customer demographics so that they can enable uh, marketing actions. So as people continue to engage with the brand, they often download the app or shop online. And you know a lot of data is used to understand what items they purchased, which ones they spent a long time considering or came back to, and which ones are the ones that they move quickly past, right? So all, all these data can be leveraged to infer intent and target future recommendations um, uh, accordingly. That's fascinating. I, every time I hear from any of you guys, it sparks off new thoughts in my head. I, I was reading that Amazon now are considering uh, a drone delivery that that's already kind of in place delivering using drones so as I said earlier but more than that they're, they're talking about delivering goods that you haven't ordered because yes. they believe their AI is so good that they know more than you what you want and their view is that you'll get this thing and you go oh, I didn't order that but you know I actually really wanted one of those I just didn't get around to ordering it and they believe that more people will keep the goods that they send on spec, then we'll take advantage of the return, you know, and all the costs involved. That's 
quite a scary thought, um, but you can see it happening. And that's what, what you're, you're uh, talking about, the use of data, the personalized data. And people say, well, that's great. That enhances the customer experience. I did also see one, which is it's now a the people that they've already developed contact lenses, battery powered contact lenses with a screen on it. And the idea is when you walk past certain triggers, it will flash onto your contact lens uh, advertising messages. You could use it for satellite navigation directly. It's just, we're, we're very, very close to things that five years ago were science fiction now becoming science fact. So that's Actually, I just wanted to, somebody, Jean's asked a question in the audience, um, uh, Rain, and the, and, and the rest of you, uh, saying, in the case of AI-driven personalization, which is what we're talking about here, are there real sort of socio-moral or moral social concerns? It's, they're talking about putting people into boxes or groups, which says basically everybody falls into this category. There's no more room to agree to disagree. You're either here or you're there. Um, I mean, uh, point to 2020 documentary the social dilemma um which i don't know i don't know if people have seen if you have is this ai driving us I, I, I'm, I'm minded to think of sheep you know sheep being herded into all the ones that are pregnant over there all the ones that are not pregnant over there whatever it may be is that happening or is it not what do we think anybody um may, may, maybe i'll go uh, have a go at that andrew please try. um yeah no, no problem uh, and it, 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 um, i share the view of rain i think your presentation was fantastic so Thank you. so well done on that one so i think i think you know where where i uh you know where, where we do and, and where we uh, provide services to our clients at synopsis is really to help them achieve better regulatory outcome and um, you know, looking at anti-money laundering, AML, uh, know your customers, KYC. So you know, some form of profiling uh, of risk uh, profile of the customer of their customers in the sense of whether or not they're going to become a, a bad guy <laughs> or they are deemed to be a bad guy. You know, so so that's that's not just profiling to sell them things. It's actually profiling to not provide the service to them, right? So so that they don't run foul of the of the regulatory uh, requirements. Now, um, and and on this particular questions around boxing people up, I mean. In, in the olden days where we try and provide a uh, risk uh, profiling, we tend to do it in you know buckets of low risk, mm -hmm. high risk, medium risk, and so on. So it's sort of a bit of a clustering and boxing people up into those buckets. And if you are falling into the high risk bucket, then potentially you know your your you need to do enhanced due diligence and so on. So, so more work that needed to be performed on that person. And I think these days, as with the availability of AI, it, it tends to you know, allow people to do uh, risk profiling at the individual level. You know, and then you, you, you sort of not box people up. Instead, it becomes a very, very much diversified, you know, you're looking at a very personalized um, a risk profiling of the individual as opposed to a, a box um, of a cluster of people. And I think that that's actually quite quite powerful because you know ultimately you know you are who you are and you know you are not a bad person for example. But then as you do transactions online, financial transactions online, for example, you know then your behavior comes into play and the behavioral uh, analysis needs to come into play and therefore you know a little bit of AI to assess whether once well, at the point in time where you're onboarded to the platform you are profiled in a certain way because you haven't started doing transaction. Yeah, but as you start doing transaction, and you know, if you are profiling them uh, on the risk level uh, based on their transactions, then you know that adds another layer of um, uh, complexity to the risk profile. But then, if you think about it, it doesn't mean that therefore you are looking at things in isolation at the individual. Because think of again, you know, if 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 you are a, a bad person or a syndicate trying to do some bad transactions, typically you may do it. You may engage a lot of smurfs, as we call them. You know, or or, or to the to, to do the bad transactions in 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 a certain pattern. So you look for pattern analysis and all that, and maybe you know the ability to then you know using one example of a person's transaction and you know expand it to any other similar transaction that is done by different people on the platform. Maybe you know at different levels or different quantum. You know that can be a, a an, an another example of the use case of artificial intelligence in the digital age because you need to be able to identify. You know, for financial crime, it's not just one transaction, it's a series of transactions, not just by one person, it could be multiple number of people doing it at about the same time. So I hope that gives a little bit of context. It's not, 
boxing people up, you should look at personalized and then in fact, you can then extend it to clustering and, and so on and so forth. I, I'm kind of hearing we, we instead of having three boxes, we have 3,000 boxes, which actually isn't boxing people as yeah. much. But I just, I, I was fascinated to use the words uh, agreeing to disagree. Um, and this is a real key issue when it comes to setting an agenda or AI. And I'll use a really simplistic example before. My daughter is a vegetarian. She thinks it's morally wrong to eat meat. I grew up old school, I, 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 do, I do eat meat. We, uh, between us, we can agree to disagree and we find a compromise, you know, when it comes to mealtime or whatever, and we're very happy living with that compromise. However, if you're going to program a machine to do something and to set a certain, would you have to program it to do either or, but not both? That's where I think this is agreeing to disagree potentially becomes problematic because you have to say, well, no, I don't really want it to give an option because you get stuck in that infinite loop that you know computers are so famous for. Um, if you've got a car speeding down the road and it's it's told that if there ever a human being gets in front, swerve and you know go into the wall and kill the passengers, but the other thing says, no, don't go into the wall because it'll kill the passengers. And that, that happens, it will just get into a loop of doing nothing, or they call analysis paralysis, because yes. it doesn't know which way to turn. Somebody somewhere has to make that decision. Uh, and that's where I think Gene's got a really good point here. Um, what is the biggest hurdle uh, that's deterring companies from adopting AGI, ASI? Ooh, mm. well, first of all, a lot of this sort of AGI, ASI does not exist um, uh, yet. So we have the moral issue, but funny enough, we ICA did a survey on this quite recently, what is preventing firms, um, and I'm going to turn this over to the panel now, what is preventing firms, and one of, the, one of the biggest reasons was an inability to persuade the stakeholders, the senior managers, uh, of the viability of the solutions. And again, luckily I'm old enough, I can say this, they're saying it's taking more to persuade the senior managers, who are tend to be older, of this shift and this change. And it was something like 20 something percent of the responders to our surveys showed this to be an issue. So I'd like to bring um, Donna, if uh, I, I can, uh, at the moment. We, we talked earlier, Donna, about the delivering change. How do we deliver change in this you know, multi-stakeholder environment that we're, we're, we're living in? What are some tips you can give us? Thanks, Andrew, and I echo, um, the earlier uh, comments by the fellow panelists, it was fantastic presentation. So thank you, Andrew. Very thought provoking. Um, delivering change. And I think um, in your presentation, you also alluded to human center, human centric design. And, and I probably want to start off with that. So um, there's a quote that people don't mind change. They just don't want to be changed or have changes done to them and but people do change and in large organization as you alluded sometimes it's harder to obtain the buy-in from multi multi-stakeholder environment and especially in a large organization multi-jurisdiction multifunctional uh, multi-product range you work with um, experts and um, have to be relied upon or interdependent with those stakeholders bring them all into this change journey requires one single thing it's an alignment of the principle um, going back to the human centric design at least in my experience consciously subconsciously people look for what's in it for me and um, elegant way to describe that is bringing that interest into the common principle of the change we're trying to implement has a business purpose. That business purpose has a shared purpose that will benefit you, your function, and wider group that you belong to. Once you are in a position to reposition why you want to instill the change, then you probably um, pave the way for overcoming the initial hurdle of, um, I guess, the business case or the shared purpose of why the change is needed. Um, I mean, you talked about multi-sector or multi-stakeholder environment. It's sometimes impossible to, to please everybody. In fact, if you're trying to do that, you're actually, in fact, pleasing nobody. 
but some of the tips um, that we we talked about, and this is um, uh, perhaps my personal experience, um, is there's there's a you know literature will talk about bucket people into the influence versus interests. Uh, quadrant, and some of you might have heard of that. So, for those people who have high influence and high interest on in this particular gender initiative, then you work with them and put all your effort into them. For those people who have high influence but lower, you know, lower interest in the agenda, you inform them because you you want to prevent their influence to to stop what you're doing. So there are techniques to that. But um, the literature side, for me personally, what really worked is once again going back to what's in it for me proposition. So you or your team as an organization delivering the common purpose, if you're able to articulate the reason why you want to implement the change, align to the purpose of the organization, your team and yourself, and can find that Venn diagram common overlap, then you'll, you'll probably have a fighting chance to get that change implemented. Again, that's, that's fascinating. In, in my world, I, I, I love this, what's in it for me. Um, as a compliance officer, former compliance officer and people who do training, that's one thing you've got to identify. If you're going to be training compliance staff, on Monday, and you're com you're training the relationship managers, the guys out in the front end and business on Tuesday. I would never suggest you need you use the same training program because what's in it for me is very different between those two audiences. And you know, with the salespeople, I, I try to hit them where it hurts in their wallet so in terms of their ego and the rewards and their status. Compliance people are much more about you know achieving results. So that's a really really useful um, insight. Thank you. I. I also I have a, you know, an old quote, you can please some of the people all of the time and you can please all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. And it is about, I, I like the idea of, you're basically marshalling your forces, aren't you? You're, you're looking at who is going to be in this for the right reasons, who can I persuade? And the higher up the food chain they are, the greater your power base becomes. And you can shift, you know, I saw it in the advent of the digital hub here. Uh, one of our audience, Tony, has uh, asked a really uh, good question. It's something I talked about. A challenge is the possible bias inbuilt into AI, into algorithms. And that bias is uh, inbuilt by the developers or the waste of time. The example I use of Amazon fav favoring men over women is a pretty good example. But he says, I understand there's limited transparency in terms of the underlying decision-making processes. Take it, it reminds me of the idea of you can't just go out and buy an off-the-shelf package, you know, you need to go beyond that. So, so his point is we can't really be sure about the fairness of any AI package that's put out to us without understanding the underlying decision-making process. And that can be yeah. massively complex. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it's a fair point. I mean, which is why this is this is the ongoing conversation, right? It's, we've never we're definitely not at Nirvana uh, for 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 this development. We're probably still at the very early stage, you know. As um as the use cases uh, gets more complex, you know, then things start to get developed. So at the end of it all, at this even at this point in time, there's obviously um, a lot of. Uh, even for financial sector, there's a lot of applications that is, you know, using uh, some form of algorithm, one way, shape or form, even be it from, you know, the front office, the trading functions, you know, we know algo trading has been there for, for decades, Do you know, uh, algorithmic trading has been there for a for long, long time, you know, so, but the one key thing around, I mean, fairness is obviously one of the, the principles that you mentioned from, from what MAS have set up, the, the principle of using uh, IDA. Now, uh, I, I would say this, yeah, um, Use of uh, artificial intelligence or even data analytics and, and whatever not itself is not the end. It's actually a means to an end, right? So that's important to, to make a distinction. And to earlier point about uh, what Donna said about change and all that is the fantastic stakeholders management. And as well as the fact that uh, why are people not adopting it and so on and so forth. But the key point it, I, would, I would say to, to this particular questions around, you know, the, 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 the fairness and all that is that no in no way shape or form if things should be operating in a in a black box it also depends on like what you said earlier on what's the risk that we're undertaking you know in using that uh, uh ai uh, um, um, technology for example you know you use a few examples they gave a few examples earlier on like for example you know a uh, home automations you know I, then straight away it came to my mind you know is that robot that that goes around my home you know to do that 
you know, mopping and, and vacuuming. I switch it on and leave it on and I make sure I close all the doors and it doesn't fall off the, the steps and so on. So then that's all fine, you know? And even if you bang against the wall and it will find its way, you know, to, to navigate and it has got a map and if you shift your furniture around, it will be able to move around on its own. So that's perfect. No risk. I don't need to understand how it works. It doesn't really bother me. But if I'm actually looking at a transaction or a, a monitoring system that may have a regulatory impact or a trading function that has got a, you know, monetary impact, then the risk of uh, not understanding what is in the black box become very high. And at the end of the day, if it, it impacts, uh, a, let's say, for example, a regulation or potential, um, you know, uh, misconduct, uh, market misconduct implication, you cannot send an algorithm or a developer to the jail. You know, you got to have that, that, that someone's got to be accountable for it. So fairness is one principle, but accountability is another principle that you cannot distinguish that from, you know, not just a developer that develops it. You know, you can't send blockchain to, to jail, but you need to make sure that you are able to uh, um, get to the person that is using that technology and doing something and, and what is the ends that he's trying to achieve. It's just such a fascinating subject. Um, something I would mention, perhaps, one of the ways in which we can go about hopefully eliminating this bias or identifying it before it goes live, and again, it's something that Singapore is very good at, is the use of sandboxes, these regulatory yeah. sandboxes in our world. And so it's like a safe environment to operate in without affecting negatively or positively um, anybody to try and iron out because Again, sometimes these biases, we just don't know that we have them. Um, one of the things I found, I travel a lot extensively all over the world teaching. And one of the things that became apparent to me very quickly was cultural bias. So you're sitting here in a country you've always lived in, and you probably don't realize that you have a cultural bias because it's just normal to you. Whereas in another country, it would seem different or unusual. You know, I, I, was, I was warned. We, we have some people coming over, let's say from the US, and it's very big, loud, and huge arm movements, uh, because that's the way in which they operate. And then perhaps in Asia, certain parts of Asia, this is not a good thing to have happen. It's too loud, it's too aggressive. There's a cultural bias uh, towards being loud and sort of pushy. So we do have to take that into account as well if we're regulating on a global stage, that's fascinating. Um, somebody's asked here about the, privacy of data, which I think is a, 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 a crucial question. There's a lot of talk about APIs allowing third parties to develop applications that will bolt on to banking applications, but not developed by the banks, but would require some kind of permission to access a certain amount of data. Privacy of data has got to remain sort of fundamental in all of this. Do we see this uh, AI causing issues with this? What do we think? Anybody have a thought? I mean, data, he who holds the data um, you know, has the power. I think that perhaps it's something we uh, have to I, be extremely careful about. You, 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 sorry, I was just yeah. saying, even in banks like Starling Bank in the UK that are quite a, a way down the road, you have to grant permission to an yeah. API provider, which has to be regulated. Uh, and this is all fine and well. People talk with big smiles on the face, but what about if they get hacked? We've seen what's happened with crypto exchanges in the last year, the numbers yeah. that have been hacked. Data protection, sorry, Taki. Yeah, no, no, I, I, think, I think on this, right, as with most, um, yeah, obviously, artificial intelligence, uh, all algorithms uh, requires data to actually be processed, you know, in order to, you know, talk about machine learning to learn and, you know, and, and the learning process then needs to be further validated by the expert, you know, to tell, uh, you know, what are the false positive, the true positive and so on and so forth, so that you can fine tune the, the, the algorithm. And I think they don't normally, you don't need actual, you know, let's say personal identifiable information to train a model. You, you can anonymize data before it goes out to a third party vendor or whatever to, you know, to be processed further. So that, that, that is not um, 
I mean, of course, when we talk about processing data, that people are concerned about, you know, data privacy, GDPR, PDPA, and all this kind of stuff that comes in, right? But, you know, I think a responsible answer to this will be to ensure that prior to sending your data out to a third party vendor that you have no control, who else they subcontract things to, you know, you do need to anonymize data quite a fair bit. And, and I think that's certainly being done by as a best, best practice. Again, it's a good point, and I'm going to, to throw a challenge out to the audience here. Um, I can't see your answers. Um, how many people in the last year or so have received a notification from their bank or from some of their years, and it say, oh, we've got some new terms and conditions, and here are 811 to 12 pages of it. Scroll down and click agree at the bottom, and you go, done. How many actually read it? We are becoming more, I think, you know, it's, it's my bank, they're a global bank, they're, they're not going to... Uh, Surely they're not going to send me anything yep. that's going to cause issues. Um, I just want to, to, to change this slant, um, slightly, if I may. We, we have a, a question in uh, the Q&A. Um, you know, how can a mid-career person keep competitive advantage in this everyone talking about AI world without having program knowledge and understanding? Um, and Rain, you, we talked about this. You, loved a, you used an expression which I absolutely love. You said Singapore, like the rest of the world, is faced with the great resignation, um, which I thought was a, a, a lovely phrase. And then can AI play a, a, a role in talent acquisition to help? I mean, we are thinking of mid-career or even uh, later people to not get left behind in this world. What do you think? Well, I think, you know, Andrew, in your presentation, you talked about whether, you know, AI is going to take away my job. Um, I just want to also, you know, chime in on that, right, firstly, because um, AI is definitely here to stay, right? Although I don't think it's going to take over our jobs in the short term, but certainly in the next 50, 60 years, who knows, right? You know, digital transformation is uh, uh, vastly uh, uh, accelerated, so we wouldn't know the future for sure. But um, I, I thought about this story, which I thought was very interesting, and it actually helped to keep the job of someone. Uh, so, you know, as we all know, the Top Gun Maverick movie has just come out and a lot of us were waiting 36 years for, for the movie to be out and the very, first, the very first edition of it, if you remember Val Kilmer who, who uh, starred against uh, Tom Cruise as uh, Iceman and some of us might know that he actually uh, lost his voice due to throat cancer. So he had actually underwent a surgery, he lost his voice and and in, in the absence of AI, he wouldn't have been able to participate in this new movie. So what they did was he, they actually created 40 models of AI using the voices that he had recorded over the you know, past many, many years in doing those movies and kind of did some synthesizing um, such that he is able to kind of speak during the uh, Top Gun Maverick and therefore he could then be a part of the movie. So that is an example of how AI could actually give him his job. Right now, back to the question about this rate resignation. Um, I, I know a lot of us are facing hiring problems. Uh, people are leaving, and that's also because people were getting very restless uh, after the pandemic, and they were looking for you know other forms of fulfillment, more fulfill more fulfilling roles. Now, the good news is that um, you know I, I think that AI can definitely play a role in various ways, whether is it uh, talent acquisition or retention, and also help to overcome skill shortages in different areas, right? So um, a lot of startups have actually sprung up over the last few years in the area of talent acquisition, where they help um, you know companies reduce the time to hire and also drive higher yields across the hiring uh, process by guiding candidates to the best fit role even before they apply. And that's really helping to improve the candidate experience in the process. Um, and you know, AI can also help to select the best fit candidates to move forward for a particular role and also redirect the, um, the second kind of like you know, the silver medalists to other opportunities in the same company. Um, so I know of AI being used in the area where they assess candidates' potential uh, by measuring quantitative reasoning skills, um, which can be used for, uh, specific, for hiring for specific um, analytical or finance roles. Um, and, you know, we talked about bias and diversity. Uh, so in that area, AI can also be used to uh, screen candidates anonymously and also deploy mm -hmm. real-time diversity analytics to prevent bias and increase hiring of uh, diverse talent. Now, um, 
the other thing about AI is the implementation of AI technologies in any organization may be more attractive than we all think, right? Many traditional organizations like the banks and government agencies have rebranded themselves to reflect their true digital capabilities in order to attract talent. And you know, two key organizations that I can see that does this very well is GBS Bank in Singapore, as well as a, a GovTech in Singapore, right? Um, and if you talk about talent retention, uh, you can actually auto-generate tailored career paths so that you can keep the right talent engaged uh, and potentially also proactively uh, match opportunities to the employee's or career aspirations. Um, AI can also be used to uh, predict potential attrition of certain employees based on the tenure and also employee uh, survey scores. So there's a lot of things that AI can do, right, in the talent acquisition and talent retention. And again, as we all are um, facing skill shortages and manpower shortages, uh, AI can also be used to achieve operational intelligence, right, in the IT area and cybersecurity area where we have severe IT talent shortage. That's where you can deploy automation and, you know, intelligence in the data centers, in the IT operations, or even in cybersecurity to actually, you know, kind of detect and respond to performance issues. Yeah. Mike, okay. chime on on that. Yeah, um, Yes, yes um, if yeah, Raywan, if I may, I might chime on a couple of points that you talked about because it's actually quite close to my heart. So we talked about AI, but some of you may have heard of intelligent automation. It's it's, it's also part of, um, I guess, the innovation, if you will. Um, and and you touched on talent retention or is AI going to take away jobs and what have you. Sometimes large organizations look at it as more of doing more. Yeah. So it's a scalability play. And how is it related to talent retention is um, sometimes as organization grows, um, there are processes that are better fitted to be um, automated through intelligent automation. What that does is not taking away the job that the person was doing before, but it creates capacity for the person to be scalable for doing more value-adding work. Um, and the other part that I would probably introduce is, um, so I, I come from New Zealand and I used to work for the largest General insurer in New Zealand. And back in 2011, there was catastrophic natural disaster in New Zealand um, and crashes earthquake. And the magnitude of that and economic impact was actually 20% of the GDP in that year. Deloitte did a study, 20% of a country, developed country equivalent to Singapore, GDP was wiped out by the natural disaster. Now, at that time, I was working for the general insurer, so the insurance company who would pay out the claims when the building goes down, yeah? Um, when that happens, that's when the operational capability of insurance company is tested very publicly. Insurance company will be judged by how well you pay your claims out when the operation is in stress. And what the company um, did, and, and I still feel very proud to have worked with the company, is they actually, at the back of the natural disaster, invested into automation because they had to deal with the demand. They had to be scalable. And the business outcome of that was the customer centricity. You had to be scalable enough to respond to the demand of the customer in the time of stress. And that'll add to shift from scale to value, because as you do the intelligent automation, the risk of your claim processing will decrease and that translates into value for the customer. So all of that is, I think in a way related to, you shouldn't look at it as a face value as a job being taken away, but it's actually regarded as doing the purpose of the organization's activity better, faster, scalable, and, and I guess the value being passed on to the customer better. So I'll look at it that way. Again, it's fascinating. You can look at examples from history. Um, Ford Motor Works are generally credited with the uh, invention of the moving production line, you know, the automated production line. And everybody said, oh, my goodness, that's everybody out of a job because this production line. And actually, their employee base grew. It, it didn't contract at all. As it said, it allowed them to move into different areas. For those, I just want to move off the subject. We've got one more subject I want to cover. For those who are concerned, honestly, do look at the... Uh, future enabled skills part of the IBF uh, website. Look at the Harvard Business Review. It is a recognized thing that skills that the 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 the, the skills that firms will want. Uh, they're not they're not just throwing everything away, but they are changing slightly. 
Um, and you can future proof and future enable, doesn't matter how young or old you are, looking at some of these websites. Uh, back to your point. Somebody uh, uh, from our audience asked about um, ethics. Yeah, it, we talked about that. Somebody's challenging whether transparency uh, is easy, uh, as easy as we think. And I, I think they're suggesting it isn't. And I, I agree, it is very difficult. When I first was asked to look at the the program that scored our potential clients in terms of risk rating, were they high risk or low risk? And we went to uh, what was then a credit company and said, produce this algorithm for us. And we put all the details in. It says, right, out of a score of 100, your client is 67. Uh, this client is 42. This client is 85. And the regulator said, well, that's all interesting. But do you understand how that score was arrived at? No, we have to. It's not enough that you don't understand. So that was quite a challenge. Um, that was a decision making process somebody asked about. Uh, the last question, because we are uh, running short of time, um, see, we could, so many things I wish we could spend more time on and talk about. Uh, somebody talked about do we see efforts to globally standardize and, and regulate and provide guidance uh, on this subject? There is mention of cooperation and standards and that kind of thing, but do we see the becoming like a super regulator or a agreement of nations? How, how do you think this is gonna go? Uh, this is blue sky stuff for all of us. What do you think? Anybody from the panel? Um, I think it's always gonna be a good thing, you know, to achieve some kind of standardization of some, some of some form. Uh, you know, but be careful what we wish for because <laughs> once it becomes standardized, then there's no room to maneuver and we, we don't, to some extent, innovation, we don't want to be stifled too much by certain, you know, global standardization that doesn't allow um, some kind of flexibility, right? So even, I think this there's a talks about digital economy agreements. I think, you know, Singapore have signed a number of digital economy, you know, with UK and with a couple of other uh, uh, countries, and it's still at the very early stage. You know, it's just a lot of posturing, or okay, we want to be the first one to sign a digital economy agreement and be able to reap the benefit of, you know, doing things digitally. But the actual work around um, how does AI uh, collaboration across two countries and standardizations, there's a concept of interoperability you know, every country will obviously be doing its own little things, you know, infrastructure and whatever not, but you want to be able to interoperate with each other, but not making everything the same, right? Uh, because they've got different sets of laws and whatnot that you need to look after. So my, my sense is that, yes, there is obviously a lot of talks around uh, cooperations um, uh, across different countries, especially with countries that have started a digital economy agreement, I think they will be the, the, the forefront of all this um, uh, race at the moment uh, around uh, you know, being the, 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 the key players out in the, in the future. Uh, absence of some kind of a digital economy agreement um, uh, beyond just country to country, you, um, you know, a bilateral agreement, we actually need more um, like a regional, like an APEC, for example, you know, like a European agreement, that, that sort of stuff that then you can actually achieve some sort of consistency. It's no good, in my view, um, to have, let's say, a, a, a GDPR version, you know, a PDPA version, and, you know, and then you end up with um, uh, regulations that um, it's never going to be um, you know, interoperable. So, but that's the way it works. I'm, I'm not sure whether this is the nirvana of the future. Again, uh, I'm sorry to keep coming back to the finance industry, but there is an example here. We have the Financial Action Task Force. This is a non-regulatory yeah. body that basically says, we believe this is what good looks like. There are 40 standards when it comes to anti-money laundering. Yeah. And that we believe this is what good looks like on a global scale. And now every country is invited to make its regulation and laws meet those 40 recommendations. And if you don't, you get published and named and shamed. It's quite a reasonable parallel, I think, if a non-government body were to come up with, this is what we think good looks like to get the buy-in, and then countries would be inspired, um, or if not forced, because they get made yeah. ashamed, to comply with that. So that's quite a good way. But I want to come back to a point that our other panelists made earlier. Just like companies 
want to gain competitive advantage through you know proper and early adoption and widespread so do countries so do so do nations you know, there is a competitive advantage to be had if you are perceived as being very strong on the ground if singapore is making a great name for itself globally you know, despite its size in leading the charge here following along with uh, europe i'm going to ask one last quick question which is a little bit light-hearted but actually um another one from gene does the widespread development and use of ai for audio and video generation i'm thinking cgi or deep fakes as he's calling it does it mean that we'll no longer be able to rely on video and audio as permissible evidence um, in you know, a legal case or whatever? Is it getting so good? Uh, rephrasing the question, is it getting so good that we won't be able to spot the real from the fake? Challenge for us, what do we think? I think I'm going to jump. I, I think the answer is I don't know yet. At the moment, you can still usually spot, even you know, with movie making like it is, where the fakes have been made. It is something that we'll have to keep an eye on. And again, maybe back to what can and cannot be yeah. um, used. Can I can I can I add a point here? Uh, Please, yeah, Andrew. Look, sort of looking at, you know, in the in the AML anti money laundering or even know your customer KYC side, a lot of the AI components such as you know OCR you know video recognition facial recognition and you know face compare a lot of these technology has already been commoditized meaning that uh, it has been well developed by the big tech firms and it's been you know sold at a, a, a you know very um uh, low low price right which means that it's available to a lot of people to use that base level and build on top of that now uh, in terms of whether or not you know, this makes it, um, you know, whether are you able to spot real from fake and all that. I think at the end of the day, as I stress that um, the technology itself is a means to an end. And if you're using AI as a means, as, as a form of control mechanism to identify certain things, it cannot be the only control that exists in the whole process itself. You know, the customer onboarding process ne necessitate there being multiple hurdles and multiple checkpoints that needed to be looked at right your preventive control your detective control so relying on one control to say hey you know if a, if a fake a deep fake it, it passes through this uh this control then what other mechanism do you have to identify other um uh, fault uh, whereby it, you you will be able to identify that this is not so, um yeah so, so it's, it's not in isolation it, it cannot be used in isolation no. it has to be looked at as a as a means to an end I'm really, I'm very conscious of time, and I'm going to beg the understanding and indulgence of our host for one more minute because somebody's posted a question, um, which I'd, I'd like to finish on, and they say they want to adopt AI and machine learning to help their business, but they're really at a loss. How do you start practically? Now, is there an open source network to go to research, or should they just bite the bullet and go to a private company? We talked about it. Going, we. We, we've talked about a lot of what we stuff, but for, for, for you guys, it's your living, it's your job. You know, you're not going to give away everything for free. You expect people to come and uh, on board. But is there, a, is there a starting place? Any recommendations you can make? Can people reach out to you? We've got 60 seconds. Rain? I, yeah, maybe if I can chime in, right? It, it's, I mean, we're, we should be looking at what is going to make the biggest impact to the business. Right, and looking at whether is it the customer engagement with you or backend, you know, finance processes, HR processes, or things like that, and decide, you know, where you're going to place the money, and only mm -hmm. from there, then you do a very targeted search on what kind of technologies are out there to add value to your business, rather than, you know, uh, in, in rather than you know implementing AI for the sake of AI, but rather looking at what is the what is the business value you can bring to the table. So to, as this person is asking the question, could, is there anywhere I could go to help me decide where I get the biggest bang for my buck? You know, because I don't know and I don't know what I don't know. Any thoughts? Is it go, is it, uh, go to an external consultant and get them to have a look on the hope that, you know, if they do a, a quick review, they'll identify areas? Oh. I, I think I think really I mean look Google is is actually quite a good source to start uh, at least okay. I think I stress again I think it's the same point that what is the ends you're trying to achieve you know AI and machine learning is the means 
Jiro, are you your if you say you want to use AI to help a business, are you going to build a AI team of data scientists, data engineers, and data analysts? Or are you going to use someone external and get that model and build it along the way? So, you know, it's not so much of, okay, there's an open source uh, platform that you can just learn everything. Are you going to do the, um, uh, the, the algorithm yourself? And it's not just doing it once and then that's it. You've got to maintain it. You've got to continuously yeah, improve that's the issue, it. Isn't it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry Chuck. I do have a question add- there because. Right. Uh, probably just one, one, one point I would add is, are we putting solution to the problem or problem to the solution? I think that that's probably the first, first question. And then after that, you can figure out how, depending on where you are there. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up, but there's a lovely quote from, from Ben here who says, when it comes to AI and deep fakes and all that, we should use AI to fight AI, which is quite a, use AI to detect deep fakes and whether it's been one which is, which is quite nice. Um, I've got to bring it to con- conclusion where we're running ever so slightly late. Apologies, Manchester, but it's such a fascinating subject. I hope that the audience will things. It just remains to say thank you so much to the panelists. You make my job so easy because you're uh, willing and engaging. Thank you to the audience for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but I have tried to sort of cover as many as I can. Um, on behalf of the panel and myself, thank you so much for, for dialing in. It makes it worth uh, us turning up. Thank you for being here. If I can now, I'm just going to hand back to our hosts at the university. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, Ryan, Donna, and Chaiki for the wonderful presentation and discussion. I mean, this can go on and the, the discussion is just wonderful and everybody has enjoyed it and particularly pick out a few points that is really interesting. Also, yeah, AI, I mean, there is just the future and opportunity of tech disruption. Innovation is just tremendous. I mean, AIs, you can use it correctly, badly, or whatever it is. And at the end, yeah, we should use it to solve the problem issues and not just for the implementing for the sake of implementation itself. So thank you so much for all the panelists. I will just quickly go through, I mean, uh, our program itself here is uh, for those who are interested to pursue your careers in the financial industry itself uh, to, for both be it uh, professionals, uh, finance, finance professionals or non-finance professionals, such as engineers, IT, talking about AI and all this thing, or even business owner from tech start out and other things, you may want to check out our program here itself. Sorry, I think I Apologies for that, Cisal. So this MSC Financial Management Program is actually a joint collaboration between Singapore and Hong Kong Center, where you actually study alongside between the both Asia top two financial hubs, Cisal, where you can actually exchange a lot more ideas and to, uh, networks together. So just quickly, briefly about our financial management program, it is actually a very well-balanced program that actually uh, talks about both the fundamentals of financials, accounting and financials, Together, the important parts about covering the business and strategy models such as venture cares, business models, financial strategies, talking about fintechs and also a new way of business management itself, rounding out with quantitative analysis. You will also be uh, invited to masterclass like training topics and also like uh, the events as such as today itself for your professional and personal development. For further inquiry, feel free to reach out to our colleagues in the Hong Kong Centre Business or myself, Justin from Singapore Centre, to find out more about the program. So, without further ado, just kindly uh, take two minutes of time to do a simple quick feedback so that you can know what we can do for you better. Last but not least, we really thank you everyone for attending today's um, lock- unlocking the power of artificial intelligence in the digital age. I hope you all have actually have a great session and some takeaway from this insightful presentations and panel discussion. And we look forward for you to see you again next time. Thank you so much again and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Lovely words. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Rain. Thanks, Jacket. Thanks, Manchester. Thanks Thank you, everyone. Well. Really good. Really glad that um, some of the feedback we're getting through the chat box. Lovely, lovely to hear. It makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. I'm going to sign off now um, and I'll see you again. Um,
in regards to beating and I'll contact her soon. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.